Hello everyone, and welcome to the Quorum Podcast. This is where academic medicine meets remote, austere, and resource-limited areas. Welcome back to the program. This is Ava Kelly. This week, I am with Dan Taylor. Dan, you're one of our remote paramedic graduates. You spent time in Ukraine and, and Kurdistan and tons of other places. Dan, welcome to the program. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Tell us a bit about yourself and your background. So I originally got involved in very traditional EMS in New York State. Uh, became an EMT in 2005, uh, volunteered for a little bit, became a medic in 2009, worked regular ambulances, 911 interfacility, um, became a volunteer and professional ski patroller, did some special event medicine while still working full time in EMS. Uh, and I, <clears throat> I figured out that the further I got from normal 911 runs, the more interesting it was, the more challenging it was, um, the, the more complicated the problems became. Uh, and so I started looking for more opportunities to, to do things like that and, and both get experience and get training. Uh, so I um, got involved with a company like Remote Medical International, um, sought out training through the Wilderness Medical Society, uh, and then started to transition my career from working 911 uh, to working internationally, and then made that change uh, really 2015, 2016. Got some additional volunteer experience um, in uh, 2017, 2018, um, and then came out for the, uh, the remote paramedic program, uh, and then completed that in um, the end of 2018. Uh, and then I've been contracting um, uh, since then, uh, Ukraine several times, Gulf of Mexico, uh, and a few other countries. I see you just got your FOM, your fellowship from the WMS. Well done. Thank you. Yeah, that uh, uh, that took a little while, but it, fortunately having experience and then the, the training through uh, Quorum uh, counted towards it. And then, and I spend a lot of my downtime trying to maintain knowledge and skills. Um, so, you know, that means attending a lot of training, and fortunately, that, a lot of that counted towards the FOM as well. How difficult was it to get those last couple of points to get your 100? Um, so, I, I will say the, the WMS made it uh, as painless of a po- uh, process as possible uh, that uh, I, they ended up giving me an individualized report that said, you know, here are the specific you know, handful of credits you need. Uh, here's a directory of uh, lectures. Uh, that you can uh, take online. Uh, so I was able to go through those and, and some of them were, were pretty interesting. Uh, but yeah, that, that really helped. And um, the, the big chunks of credits and then things like the attending an in-person WMS event, I had already taken care of. So it was uh, just, you know, a couple last credits. Nice. Yeah, it, it took me a bit to get those last bits. So I wound up having to do uh, the online stuff that the uh, WMS offers. But it's um, yeah. Welcome to the club. It's it's a it's a great um, thing to have after your name. Yeah. So Dan, you have your WPC as well. I, I see you just got that. How was that exam? How was that prep for getting the wilderness paramedic? Uh, yeah, that was um, November of 2023. Uh, I took that. Um, so it was it was good. Obviously, the, right now there's no full review course, um, but I think fortunately. Having done the FOM, having taught a decent bit of wilderness medicine through a couple different companies, having been involved in um, tactical medicine and attended um, the Special Operations Medical Association um, Scientific Assembly uh, multiple years now, um, just being very generally interested in remote austere wilderness and tactical medicine uh, was very, very helpful. And then the last couple of years, uh, I've been uh, qualified for wildfire, but I haven't deployed uh, just because of scheduling. But I've um, taken uh, rope rescue training and, and some other uh, other courses to prepare myself better for that environment. So that uh, plus some kind of additional rescue focused training really helped me prepare uh, for the exam. Um, and then just in the kind of days leading up to it, I went back through some of the WMS uh, clinical practice guidelines, went back through some of the prolonged field care uh, clinical practice guidelines, um, just kind of 
reviewing things that maybe I hadn't looked at in a little bit. Um, uh, but I think that because I had a lot of previous experience and training uh, and was just kind of generally interested in this stuff for quite a while, uh, there were a lot of, uh, or at least a few questions that I don't think I studied for specifically, but I had encountered in one way or another. Uh, and that made uh, it made the exam uh, easier to pass, but it was still nerve wracking. I mean, honestly, at the end, I really wasn't sure if I had passed. Um, and so I was mm. very pleasantly surprised when I got the, the email about it. So what number do you have of, of your WPC? Uh, 100 something, 100. I want to say maybe 114. I'd have to look at the card. So, Dan, you've deployed multiple times to Ukraine. Would you be willing to chat with us about your experiences? What what were you doing and, and how was that for you? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so that's so I think Ukraine is where I have the most sustained um, experience. Uh, a number of my other deployments to other countries have been a little bit shorter because of a an acute onset disaster or um, or something like that. So uh, my first uh, deployment to Ukraine was uh, January of 2019. So uh, I know for a lot of folks, they think Ukraine got invaded in 2022, uh, but really it was invaded in 2014. Um, that was mm -hmm. the annexation of Crimea, the invasion um, in uh, uh, the um, in the, the east of the country in the Donbass. Um, so following that initial invasion, there the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, which is a multinational organization, uh, was. Uh, through the Minsk Accords there to monitor violations of the ceasefire that went into effect in, I believe, 2015. Uh, and so I was contracted through uh, an American company to be uh, an embedded paramedic, or, and actually the job title was remote paramedic, uh, with the field team. So the OSCE had security monitors that would go out and they would assess um, the impact of the conflict on civilian infrastructure, on the lives, the day-to-day -day lives of civilians, ask them how they were being treated by the authorities. And this was both the Ukrainian controlled and the non-government controlled areas where the, the Russian um, separatists are. Uh, and I worked I had the great experience of being able to work on both sides. So literally we would cross the, the front line um, in a very controlled manner. Uh, so I spent most of 2019 working on that mission. Um, the contract was two months on, one month off, uh, but I uh, volunteered to cover some time for other people. I came in a little early a few times, left a little bit later, uh, which was one of the ways I was able to um, see a little bit more of the mission. Um, and so with that day in and day out, we were out in the field. Um, most of the, the actual medical care was sick call. It was musculoskeletal issues, sort of the, the what is really the bread and butter of a remote paramedic. It's the common things. Uh, but we did yeah. have a full advanced life support capability. We had narcotics. We had a uh, full advanced cardiac life support kit. We had a, um, an AED, oxygen, um, with the expectation that should not only a trauma, but a true medical emergency occur, uh, that we would be able to be there um, to start providing care uh, and then interface with either the local healthcare system or move them back to one of our bases where we had a uh, local physician and additional um, capability. Um, so that was a an interesting mission because there was always this uh, constant threat of trauma. And, and I mean, on a daily basis, we heard artillery and small arms and, and things like that. Um, uh, and the, the only person actually killed on the mission was actually one of the paramedics who was killed there uh, mm -hmm. a couple years before I arrived. Um, so there was always that concern, but most of our actual work was, you know, more mundane kind of routine issues. And you've been back since then as well. Yeah. So fortunately, um, I've had relationships with some um, non-governmental organizations. Uh, and uh, I think both the relationship and my previous history in the country uh, made me a good fit. So after the full-scale invasion in 2022, I went back uh, with Global Response Medicine, and they were running um, three programs, uh, Medivac, uh, an embedded surgical team, and then TCCC uh, uh, and 
uh, emergency medicine training program. I was the project manager instructor and one of the paramedics with the uh, training program. Uh, so we were a mobile training team. We did uh, primarily TCCC uh, all service members uh, with some content from the tactical emergency casualty care uh, curriculum as well. Uh, that program was delivered in multiple cities across Ukraine, um, all the way as far east as Dnipro, um, places like Rivni, Chernobyl, Kolmanitsky, uh, and Kyiv. Uh, we trained uh, soldiers, uh, members of public safety, the um, emergency services, um, regular paramedics as well. Uh, and the the goal was to um, help give them a very baseline level of training to provide modern, you know, updated trauma care. Um, many of the individuals wouldn't be expected to deliver care under fire, um, but <clears throat> when the entire country of Ukraine is uh, under threat of drones and long range missiles, it means that even somewhere far away from the front line can have a sudden onset of blast injuries and shrapnel injuries and, and all that. Uh, so the regular paramedics that are on a you know normal civilian ambulance may experience um, you know patients with serious trauma. So we were giving them uh, a, a good update on training that they may have had uh, in the past, uh, and then also trying to lay the groundwork so that as they got additional training, um, either from other NGOs or um, from members of the Ukrainian government and military, uh, that, they, that it would dovetail well. So we were presenting the phases of care. <clears throat> we explained, you know, at that point, they didn't have the ability to give blood pre-hospitally. That has now changed. But we explained the, the value of that and how that could fit into their care. Uh, so we were helping to try to lay that foundation and then help them um, interface with other training. Uh, within that program, we also trained uh, we did um, kind of one day updates for physicians um, and kind of other advanced practice providers. Some of those were civilians, some of those were military. Um, and the idea there was that uh, many of them were not primarily military providers. They were people who had normal lives until their country was invaded. Uh, and they were either beginning to enter the military or they had already joined. And so uh, we wanted to, again, give them kind of an update with the assumption that they knew a lot of good medicine already, that some of them already had done surgical residencies, um, that they had specialties that may not be uh, war trauma. And so we were providing them with the TCCC guidelines, providing them with uh, opportunity to work through the phases of care and then to really use their ability as a medical provider uh, to uh, support their patients to the best of their ability, and then to work with other other individuals in that environment. That many of the scenarios we ran ended up having physicians working alongside civilian paramedics, working alongside uniformed combat medics, because that's the reality of war in an urban area. And then when a, a country the size of Ukraine is under threat, when something happens, you have this um, multi-jurisdictional, multi-organizational response. Um, and that's true both right at the front um, and then also, um, you know, within cities a little bit further away. So that training program was pretty interesting. We, um, I also believe it's really important to not only train, but to equip as much as possible. So if we're teaching people to use tourniquets or, or use medical devices, uh, there's, not, there's a diminished value if we're not able to provide that tool right away. So with that training program, every student also received a uh, basic uh, IFAC, individual first aid kit. Uh, so that had a tourniquet, non-hemostatic gauze, pressure dressings, chest seals, trauma shears, Sharpie, um, kind of all the stuff you would you'd expect to be an individual trauma kit. So the students got to train with those items, and then they left the classroom um, with their own uh, kit as well. Um, nice. So yeah, that that was that was great, and I'm really glad that the donor funding um, made that possible. Um, within that, 
I guess within my role as a project manager, we also had a physician in country that was separate from the mobile training team that was doing um, uh, bedside mentoring and point of care ultrasound training as well. Uh, so she was actually, you know, in the emergency department with uh, the the Ukrainian uh, staff and was at the bedside seeing patients with them. And, and she's a, a qualified emergency medicine physician herself, um, <clears throat> and so she was able to provide coaching and 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 she had a ton of experience in remote and austere environments. So there wasn't really any handholding I had to do uh, for that physician. It was supporting her logistically, uh, making sure that um, you know she had an outstanding interpreter uh, and that the introductions were made. And then basically I just kind of supported her remotely. Uh, so that was, um, yeah, that was kind of the first program uh, in 2022. Um, any, any questions, anything more you wanna know about that? Yeah, what are the lessons learned you got from your two deployments to your Ukraine? Uh, basically, every every time I've been in Ukraine, there has been uh, a training element to the mission. Um, some of it was more hands on, uh, was more uh, clinical. Some of it was more training. Um, but yeah, so I would say having a good under so I, a takeaway for me was the importance of having a good understanding of what the baseline capability and knowledge of the audience is, and this is true certainly for any environment, um, but when a country is at war, um, and especially when they have uh, resources flooding in, innovation tends to accelerate. So what students knew you know, in, in February or, or April of 2022, was a lot less than what they knew even six months or a year later. And so <clears throat> being able to reevaluate and say, look, we, we delivered this training, let's make sure that it was effective, and then build on that and create programs that really enabled those students to grow even further and then connecting them with resources that they, so that they could continue learning on their own. Um, I've sent a lot of people to the Deployed Medicine website. Um, there's uh, a version of the Deployed Medicine uh, website that's been translated uh, into Ukrainian. There's a lot of clinical practice guidelines and the TCCC guidelines themselves that are available uh, in Ukrainian as well. So connecting the training that we're doing to these additional learning opportunities with the expectation that they're going to continue to grow um, well beyond uh, what we taught. Um, being able to use really <clears throat> inexpensive uh, locally sourced training models. Um, so making wound packing models with uh, foam and other components from a hardware store. Um, you know, sometimes lower fidelity is okay with some of our training models if we're doing good initial uh, education and we're getting them good reps. Um, I mean, I there is still a ton of value in high fidelity simulation, um, but there are financial costs, there's additional logistics with some of that. Um, so it's not always possible. So if you make the intentional trade-off to do good quality, lower fidelity, um, that can still help develop some of the basic muscle memory that's needed for things like tourniquet application, wound packing, um, getting students reps in their gear. Um, you know, if, it's, if we're talking about the firefighters, they have a plate carrier, they have their traditional firefighting turnout gear, their helmet, their gloves, their boots, um, soldiers, you know, all the, uh, the typical tactical equipment, letting them actually train in all of that kit really helps them better understand what it's going to be like. It helps them make adjustments to what they're carrying and how they're doing it um, and helps them understand you know, working on a casualty that has the same level of protection because um, we always think about, you know, self-aid, uh, buddy aid, Medicaid, uh, that that means the person that has the protective equipment on may be the patient. Um, so that, you know, that was an important kind of takeaway and, and starting in the classroom in a more relaxed setting and then escalating to, uh, you know, full speed run throughs. Um, and then I think really listening to the students and being able to build rapport um, so that they can explain the problems that they're encountering, the things that they're really afraid of, uh, the 
the, the things that we might be able to help them with uh, that are simply not on our radar um, or that maybe we, we don't view as high of a priority, but they absolutely do, you know, correctly or incorrectly. Um, but having enough rapport with them that they will be honest um, and really be pretty vulnerable when they say, hey, this thing really scares the hell out of me. Can we cover that in class? Absolutely. Um, that um, uh, chemical agents and white phosphorus were two things that people really brought up. Um, we've certainly seen more white phosphorus used in Ukraine than chemical agents, but there have been um, chemical agents, more of the riot control um, agents used. Uh, but those were two things that uh, yeah, we, we ended up teaching in multiple different venues because it was a high concern uh, for the students. Um, and I think with mm -hmm. that, admitting where we had our own shortcomings and experience or knowledge, um, I mean, with with both with especially with the white phosphorus, uh, I haven't seen those patients before, and I've had students that have. Uh, so being able to you know be pretty open about my limitations there and and gain knowledge from their experience and having them share with the class, um, and then saying, hey, I don't have a great answer for that right now, but let me reach out to some people. Um, and I've, I've been able to reach out to a number of uh, really outstanding experts uh, and then some people who I thought might have the answer, but then they ended up going to another expert and bringing that information back. And I was able to pass that along. So um, I think kind of the fundamentals and knowing your own uh, limitations was was part of the, the lessons learned there. And, and have you already planned your next trip to Ukraine? Uh, no, not. I wouldn't say the planned it. Um, I have a strong desire to return. I'm trying to figure out the both the best opportunity and uh, you know when it fits into kind of my my professional life. Um, if I'm going to go back as a volunteer, uh, that's a different consideration than if I go back taking on another contract. The last time you were there, were they introducing the printed tourniquets, or is that uh, since you've you've come back? Yeah, so. I saw some of those and I saw, um, uh, actually, so one of the really kind of interesting things about being there in April and May of 2022 was seeing the, the scramble um, to create new materials and new tourniquets. Uh, so uh, yeah, I saw, so even back then I saw some of the very early versions of some of the printed tourniquets at that point, um, the print material for the windlass was not great, um, but that's been mm -hmm. significantly improved upon. Um, I saw a number of different varieties of tourniquets, not 3D printed, but made using, um, in an intentional manner, hardware store materials, things purchased from um, sewing shops, and then kind of mass produced um, you know, sewn. And some of those were, were better than others, but there was a lot of variety uh, and it was, we think about improvised materials and often that's improvised on the spot, but I'm a big proponent uh, that if you've identified a gap and you're not able to you know, meet the need commercially on the right timeline, you could improvise in advance in a very intentional way. Um, and that's exactly what, what they were doing is they were using the locally available materials, webbing, um, hardware store materials, sewing shop materials, and then as an assembly line, sewing those together uh, and then and then pushing those out. Um, and some of them, uh, I, I, some of them were a little bit too short especially when you think about um, like a military age male who works out like the leg. Um, some of them just weren't quite big enough for that. Um, but some of them were pretty decent. Um, and we never told students to really throw those away. We just said, here is a generation seven cat that we're going to give you. That's your primary. If you get another cat, great. That's your secondary. And then, you know, keep this other device as a tertiary or, or in reserve um, until such a point as you have enough of the ideal units. Um, I also saw some of the early generations of the Nipro tourniquet, uh, which was being produced in Ukraine. Um, and that device has evolved uh, a decent bit. Um, and in its current, current generation um, seems to be a pretty solid unit. I saw one when I was there, and, and they're so innovative on creating stuff uh, in, in country. But there was a tourniquet there that was had the both incorporation of the cat and the soft tea. Is that the Nipro? 
Yeah, uh, so it's got the Velcro from the cat. It's got the Velcro, and it's got the, the buckle so you can unbuckle it like the soft tee. I think that is the knee pro, yeah. Uh, yeah, I was, I was really impressed, and I, I nicked one. Uh, this is before the war, so I wouldn't have nicked it at, uh, during the war. But in 2019, we were teaching there, and, and I saw that, and they donated it to us. We have it in a classroom. It's just really clever. But the innovation that's coming out of that is uh, astounding, and it's, it's innovation under duress, of course. But the, the Ukrainians are coming up with some amazing technology. Yeah, and I think that's one of the things that we, you know, for, for anyone that's outside of a conflict, uh, we need to recognize that conflict drives innovation. You know, it, and we, we may have previous experience that may be relevant, um, but without being in the conflict, and I don't mean a party to the conflict, but just being present um, within the, the country, it's hard to capture and observe some of that innovation, um, especially when some of the innovation is good and then some of it gets you know, recognized as, as not working as well as had hoped. That if we just see a single photo or a single video, uh, we end up potentially missing out on a lot of the lessons learned. Um, and in a lot of these conflicts, whether we talk about Ukraine or, or Gaza, the people that are innovating, um, they may get killed before that information gets shared. Uh, or they simply, you know, if they survive the conflict, they may not have the ability, uh, the freedom of movement to actually go to conferences and, and to spread that information. So... Uh, hmm. yeah, I think it's, it's critical to capture and share that information. Um, and I think some of that means being kind of on the ground, um, kind of living solidarity alongside, uh, you know, our colleagues in the field. So Dan, whilst you're deployed in Eastern Ukraine, what was one of your more interesting cases? Um, well, I did a little veterinary care, which was unexpected for me. Um, in a general sense, I think a lot of folks are aware that, you know, conflicts have psychological effects on people, people that are living in constant conflict um, certainly have um, kind of a heavy burden psychologically. Uh, and I think one of, and this is pure speculation, I think one of the Coping mechanisms is trying to fix things, uh, fix little things that um, may give us a little bit of hope and a little bit of happiness. And so I've seen a lot of animals that have been hurt and, and injured in the conflict uh, that are receiving a lot of really great veterinary care um, in Ukraine. Um, and so there was an instance where uh, with, a, with a different organization, um, we did a training program where we were embedded. Uh, we did classroom training in a safe area, and then we were embedded in the field with the evacuation teams. And this um, Ukrainian NGO that we were embedded with um, to provide kind of mentoring and, and advising in the field, uh, they ended up rescuing a number of animals, um, a couple of dogs, some cats. Uh, one of the cats had uh, was a was a very underweight kitten at the time uh, and had a significant injury to her back leg. Uh, the uh, international paramedic that was with the team when the kitten was first found, started treatment, did a uh, telemedicine consult informally, um, started providing uh, wound care and some of that, and then transferred care to me. Um, and I did some dressing changes and, and provided some additional feeding and kind of continued the care plan uh, that had been established with the veterinarian that was consulted remotely. Um, and eventually that cat got resettled in Germany, uh, of all places, with, uh, with a volunteer. Uh, so wow. it, it was, and I say that, that kind of story, it was just interesting that this was not just a single animal. This was something that the volunteers who had a high degree of trauma, this was a point of hopefulness. This was something that, you know, everybody loves kittens and puppies, but I think there was more to it than this. It was that if we can make a difference here, you know, maybe, maybe we can make a difference elsewhere. Um, and then just from a medical standpoint, you know, it was, 
uh, multidisciplinary. Uh, it applied a lot of human fundamentals. It uh, applied a lot of soft skills. Uh, and then you know, it was the kind of the creativity that, that is necessary to really be functional and effective in some of these environments. You know? That's something that we don't focus on, is it? That uh, there could be non-human casualties that we treat. Absolutely. Uh, and I, and I, even if you just think about the tactical world, like obviously there are military working dogs. Um, Ukraine has shown that there are, you know, Patron, this uh, UXO dog, is a Jack Russell Terrier. So not the big German Shepherd that most people think of or the Belgian Malinois. Um, so, you know, on that side, we think about canines, but I know like the, the 18 Delta pipeline includes veterinary training because there's this assumption that the 18 Delta, the special forces medic is going to be embedded with indigenous forces, that those forces may have livestock that are an important part of their community. Um, and I would say in, in the remote world, we, we interact with a lot of different communities and animals are sometimes, um, you know, a, a means of, of survival. Uh, and other times it's a means of psychological support and sometimes it's both. And if we're able to do a little something to improve that or even consult uh, with someone who knows more, um, that can really go a long way. Um, and then there's also just the concern of sometimes zoonotic diseases um, get into people as well. And so we may be looking at the, the human illness being related to an issue in the animal population there also. Dan, you and I first met in Pretty Bay, Malta in 2018 on your remote paramedic course. Why did you choose Quorum for, for the paramedic? Why? What was your motivation? What did you learn and what did you take away from it? Uh, so I knew at that point, so I, I think it was interesting at that point in my career that um, I had already had two really life-changing experiences working internationally. Um, uh, one in Greece um, with Team Rubicon International treating refugees, and then one in uh, Iraq uh, with Global Response uh, Medicine um, treating war-wounded casualties from the Battle of Mosul. That from those experiences, I realized that I had a pretty deep passion for working in these difficult places. And I was looking for education that would enable to me, enable me to be more effective in the field that would allow me to do more good and would, would really broaden my horizons. Um, so when I was looking for additional training, like there, there are certainly some short courses here and there. Um, I had uh, taken a really outstanding short trop med course, um, through Walter Reed. Um, and that was, very narrowly focused, but it was an outstanding program. But I was looking for something that was going to tie together some of the experiences and some of the short courses um, and give me more and help me, um, I think, have a, a more well-rounded understanding of what the remote paramedic is and, and could be. Uh, and so really the the Coram program was the only one, and I, 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 st I think it still is, really the only program that in a formal way, teaches, or I should say open enrollment program, because um, there are certainly military courses that, that cover a lot of this, but teaches people to practice in these difficult environments and lays the foundation for them to be able to, to learn more. Um, so the going through the program in Malta uh, in person, um, the hands-on was fantastic, getting um, practice, doing uh, doing minor skills, I mean, smaller things like uh, wound debridement, um, running scenarios with um, kind of with the the high fidelity that um, your your um, makeup artists and, and special effects folks uh, provide, um, doing things like prolonged field care in a training environment um, where there's pressure, but ultimately the stakes are a little bit lower. Um, so being able to kind of work through some of those problems in an environment where there were knowledgeable instructors that had a variety of experiences, being able to have conversations with some of the other students, some who had uh, a lot of previous kind of remote military medicine experience, others who were, were quite new. Um, 
so it was both the kind of formal block of instruction um, as well as the discussions that were happening adjacent to that. Um, all of that was was really quite helpful. Um, I I definitely like learning in person. I so it was nice to be able to be in one place for a month, go to class and, and um, go throughout the day and then have um, you know time in the evening or in the morning to study a little bit more or, um, or, or try to clarify something. Um, and then uh, with the, the kind of paramedic cohort, uh, towards the end, we had the, the TTEMS and the, was it the RLMS? There was the two weeks that were public enrollment. That's right. Uh, the remote medical life support. Yeah, yeah. So it was it was kind of fun to have the first part of the month be the paramedic cohort, and then the last two weeks we had these other classes that were you know still hugely beneficial to the paramedic cohort. But then we had uh, you know the the students from all over the world that came and went through these additional scenarios, and and they brought a lot to it as well. Um, so uh, it was. Overall, I think the, the breadth of it was really useful. And I, um, as an American, I think it's easy for me to look at American standards and, and think kind of narrowly that that's the, the right way. Um, so having instructors and, and guidelines um, and material from a broad range of countries and resource uh, levels was quite helpful. So you know, looking at European standards for resuscitation, um, learning from the Australian um, instructors about sort of their standard of care as well as what they're really uh, innovating on, um, you know, the, that I've, I found quite helpful uh, and, and educational as well. It is quite interesting to see the different People coming, people coming in from from different countries, and and how they are trained. Some are degree paramedics, some are not. But it is from from our perspective, it's definitely quite interesting to see you guys come through and coalesce as a team. Yeah, and it was really enjoyable, uh, especially given all the the different backgrounds. Dan, my final question for you is this: What advice do you have for? the remote paramedic, the, the, the new nurse, the new doc, who is just starting out on their career? So I look at that in two ways. Um, I think there's the professional side and then the personal side. So on the professional side, learning both as much as possible in the initial training um, and then seeking out new sources of knowledge um, as you enter the career field uh, is, is critical. Um, and that's looking at different countries, different organizations, clinical practice guidelines, um, trying to stay up on kind of the, the trends, I guess, um, especially as we see more evidence-based medicine coming out. Um, granted, that is also really difficult to do given the volume of information, um, but being able to be aware generally of how the the practice of medicine is continuing to evolve so that when a new protocol or a new guideline comes out, you're not shocked by it, uh, but that you recognize, yeah, you know, we, we expected that calcium was going to become much more prominent in trauma um, or, you know, we're, we're having this conversation about pressors um, in, in shock and, and we understand why those conversations are being had and why older medications are being reevaluated. Um, so I think that kind of ongoing learning and, and trying to be aware of both how we are practicing to the best of our ability right now and then what changes are coming up uh, is, is really useful. Um, finding a particular aspect of the medicine that really uh, interests you and, and really kind of excites you is pretty important. And some people end up doing that anyway, but it can be easy to stretch yourself too thin and, and not go deep anywhere. Um, but if you do find a couple areas or, or one area that is of particular interest, you know, embrace that and, and let yourself dive in um, while maintaining, you know, the adequate um, breadth of, of knowledge um, and being very honest about the skill and knowledge fade that happens, especially if we are primarily working in a remote environment where we may have uh, either one type of patients, maybe we only see military-aged males uh, with, with significant trauma, uh, or maybe we 
uh, are in an industrial environment where we see very few uh, patients because there's a good safety culture and, and medical screening and so on. Um, so being very honest with both yourself and, and with employers about you know, how, re how recently have you done a procedure, how many repetitions have you gotten in, um, I think that's really uh, pretty pretty important, and you know we can fight some of that um, through clinical rotations and then through um, you know good high fidelity simulation uh, when it's available. Um, but yeah, so I think kind of on the the professional side, that would be my advice. Um, and then on the personal side, uh, you know, recognizing burnout, recognizing um, how these environments and these experiences impact you uh, sooner rather than later is you know, really critical. Um, I think most people can probably benefit from therapy in some form. Um, you know, maybe it's a monthly check-in, um, maybe it's something more intensive, uh, but some of these experiences can be incredibly positive and at the same moment, deeply heartbreaking. Uh, and we as medical professionals often get really good at compartmentalizing um, and necessarily so that in the midst of a crisis, we have to be able to separate the clinical practice guideline from our feelings about what's happening um, and manage our own physiologic response to the crisis. Um, but there's ultimately there is a limit to, to that time-wise. Uh, so I think being able to recognize what in your own body and your own mind is serving you the best, being able to take care of that and, and kind of promote your longevity. Um, and then recognize that there's points where maybe you need a different position, you need a different contract, um, just because you know your your state at that moment is not optimized for a particular environment. It's and that can vary quite a bit person to person. Um, but that kind of self-awareness and, and being able to manage uh, the chronic stress, I think, that we can encounter. Yeah, I think that's on the personal side. I think that's kind of important. Valid points. Like having a therapist to talk to is a fantastic suggestion. And I think a lot of soft units are incorporating that into their fundamental need of keeping a fit fighting force. So um, I'm glad you mentioned that. Yeah, and that's uh, that's really been encouraging to see the because I think where where the soft world goes, um, other communities will will follow. Um, so having you know performance psychology, having therapists, having better family support, having um, you know, even. Um, better athletic trainers and, and physical therapy and, and things like the Thor program um, for American Soft, all of that really shows the importance of that holistic view of, in that case, the warfighter. Uh, but that makes it easier for other people and other organizations to say, hey, if SF or MARSOC or the SEALs think it's important to take care of these guys in a proactive way to support their mental health, maybe we should do the same things. Maybe we should look at some of the same solutions or, or recognize that our personnel may have similar stressors that are being unaddressed and we need to start trying to figure out a, a way to do that. Um, and then these soft organizations have great budgets, so it allows for further research, it allows for more development and innovation. Um, and then a lot of that will eventually trickle out to other communities, which is you know, beneficial for everybody. Valid points. Valid points. Uh, Dan, thanks for joining us on the, on the program. Appreciate your input and I appreciate you on, on what you're doing with the training you have and, and pushing forward, uh, especially in, in, in Ukraine as well as elsewhere. Awesome. Thank you for having me. It's, uh, it's been a lot of fun so far and I continue to, or I uh, intend to continue doing it. This has been a presentation from the College of Remote and Offshore Medicine. If you would like to earn CPD credits for this podcast, you can join the Council of Members. Being a member of the college gives you free CPD credit, free access to our virtual field guide, and discounts on our e-learning courses. You can join the team on our college website at quorum.edu.mt.